Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. As we continue our study of the Gospel of Matthew. How do you prepare for the coming of a king? I mean, the coming of a king is a big deal, right? If a, if a king were coming to your house, there would be a lot of preparation that you would undertake to prepare your house to honor him. I, a lot of preparation, so much preparation, in fact, that preparing for a king and queen was the plot line of a movie. Many of you seen the Downton Abbey movie? Um, that was the whole plot. The king and queen were coming, and we've got to prepare for the king and queen coming. And if you think that is a little thin for a plot for a two-hour movie, you'd be right. And yet they did it. Um, And I love Downton Abbey even saying that. A lot of preparation that took place in that movie. They cleaned the whole manor. They polished all the silver. They bought a ton of food. They got new clothes. They invited tons of guests from around the estate, all in an effort to honor their ruler. And that's how you normally prepare to meet a king. That's how you normally prepare to welcome a king, at least a normal king. But the king that we're learning about in the Gospel of Matthew is a bit different. And as we'll see in our text this morning, He requires a different kind of preparation. You don't need a big palace to receive him. You don't need fancy things to receive him. He already owns everything on the planet anyway. And by the way, he's coming from heaven. Doesn't get much better than that. No, the kind of preparation that is needed for this king is a spiritual preparation, a personal preparation. According to our passage today, What we need to do to prepare to receive the king and his kingdom is to repent. Repent. The repentant will be the ones who are ready to receive this king. This morning as we look at Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 to 12, we're going to be challenged. We're going to be challenged to be prepared to receive this king who's just been born that we've been learning about in the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be prepared to enter into his kingdom. And then additionally, we're going to be challenged to help others to prepare, to be ready to receive King Jesus. Are you ready? And are you helping others to be ready to receive the king who has come. I hope this morning you are moved by the message that we hear in Matthew chapter 3. I hope you are compelled to share it because it, it really matters. Eternity is on the line. Let's look together at our passage, Matthew chapter 3, and see what Matthew offers us today under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Beginning in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he, John the Baptist, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his wrist and a waste, and his, his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him in the wilderness, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, and they were coming to, to judge, to see whether or not it was acceptable, he said to them, You brood of vipers. Man, that's a tough comeback. Anybody ever had that yelled at you? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, The axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. 
But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is a central text in the Gospel of Matthew. A lot of very important ideas are introduced in terms of what the ministry of Jesus will be about and and who he will be ministering to. Let's see how this preparation unfolds, not only for the understanding of the gospel, but also for us to receive the king who has come, King Jesus. The preparation begins with the introduction of a really interesting guy. His name is John the Baptist. I'm sure many of you have heard his name before, but for those of you who have not or would like to know more about him, let's consider for a moment who he is. Well, John was a part of Jesus' family. His mom was a relative of Jesus' mother, Mary, who we've talked about. And from the moment of John's conception, we are shown that he will play a central role in directing the attention of the world to the Savior, King Jesus. In fact, when We look at the Gospel of Luke in chapter 1, verse 41. John the Baptist leaps in his mother's womb to direct her attention to the unique work of God that is happening in her relative Mary. And just as he prepares his mom in the womb to look at the unique work of God in Christ, to receive the revelation of the Holy Spirit, he works to prepare others as God said he would. You see, His preparatory role, John the Baptist, was a role that was prophesied about. Prophesied in the the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And here's what God says through Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter Destruction. So the people of God have been instructed by God to look for a new Jerusalem, not a reincarnated Elijah, but a new Elijah who would turn the attention of the people of God to the salvation of God and help them be free from the destruction that was coming. And Matthew wants us to know that John the Baptist is this new Elijah. He gives us a hint with his clothes, right? It's kind of an unusual clothes for a pastor. I'm not sure how many of you would listen to me if I was up here in a camel hair toga with a, a rope belt around my waist. But yet that's exactly what he wore. And that's because there's a relation there to Elijah. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, you'll see the clothes match. So even the, the clothing here is meant to be a signal to us and the people of God there that this guy, is like Elijah. Maybe he's the one that we need to listen to because he's going to be preparing the way for the promised king, the promised Messiah. And if that hint wasn't enough, Jesus confirms explicitly later that John the Baptist is the new Elijah in chapter 11, verses 7 to 15, where he says John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy of the new Elijah. Incredible. Another fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, pointing us to the reality of King Jesus. And this man has a message, a powerful message, meant to prepare the people listening listening to him to receive the king who had come. Just listen to the message, powerful but simple. Declaring to these people in the Judean wilderness, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we see in verse 2, that's his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He preached a message, this man, of repentance. The people of God needed to repent in order to make themselves ready for the king. Well, if this is the central message of John the Baptist and the central message of the kingdom of heaven, it's probably pretty important that we understand what it means to repent. So what does it mean? What does it mean to repent? Well, in the most basic sense, repentance means to turn. It means to change. In a biblical sense, it means to acknowledge wrong 
and to turn to something better, to turn from that which does not honor God to that which does honor God. And here's how normally that that happens, how we come to that place of repentance. We receive conviction from the Holy Spirit of God that there's something in our life that is not honoring to God. And if we want to prepare to receive, to be more receptive, to be part of this, this kingdom, we need to confess that. We need to say of that sin, that thing that does not honor God, what God has said about it. So conviction leads to confession that leads to brokenness because we recognize what it's cost. We recognize that that sin is limiting my fellowship with God who created me, who wants me to have fellowship and enjoy Him both now and forever. We recognize also what it cost Jesus, what it demanded of Him that we're reading about in the Gospel of Matthew. But we also rejoice in the provision that God has made. That, that sin does not have to separate us, not forever, but rather It can be confessed and covered by the blood and the work of Christ. And now we want to walk faithfully in obedience to the King who has saved us. And so confession leads to brokenness, leads to commitment, to walk differently, to be a worthy citizen in the kingdom that is coming and that has come. The people of God need to be a repentant people, repentant with fruit. Matthew wants you to know from the beginning of the gospel that you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two different kings. There's only one king who is worthy of your devotion. There is only one king who is worthy of your worship. There's only one kingdom that is worth living and dying for. And that is King Jesus and the kingdom of Christ. And baptism is the outward sign of what God is doing internally. And we're going to learn more about that next week. As we see here on the page, those who repent are baptized to declare to everyone what it is that God is working in their hearts. You know, as I was studying this passage this week, I was struck by the simplicity and the power of this message. It's an interesting guy. Yeah, interesting man. But a powerful message, and it, it convicted me. And I think it hopefully will convict us as the church that, you know, sometimes we make the gospel more complicated than it is. Sometimes we think that the message of the gospel needs more to help it be impactful, to help it be effective. And so we put all of these, these things around it, thinking that it's going to help it, but in reality, oftentimes becomes distractions. This guy, this, he's so simple. He, he's in the Judean wilderness. Isn't that interesting? He's not in the city. He's not in the palace. He's not in the temple. He's in a wilderness. And yet, people are coming to him to hear what he has to say. And when they come, what do they find? They don't find somebody dressed like me. They find a, a kind of crazy guy, right? I mean, he, he's living out there. He's eating bugs and honey. Probably got a long beard, long hair. If any of you heard... There was a guy down I-20 in some field who lived in a tent and wore animal hair and ate bugs all the time. Would any of you think, he may know something about God that I need to hear? (laughs) Right? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that people would be leaving the city to go out in the wilderness and hear a message from this guy. And yet there was something about the message that drew them. There was something about the, the content And the the anointing upon this man that made his voice and the message that it was proclaiming powerful. Hear me. John the Baptist does not need a massive platform. He does not need a palace to get attention. He does not need pyrotechnics to capture the attention of people. He doesn't need fancy clothes. The message of the gospel is enough. Some years ago, I was preaching a camp. I, get, I love preaching camp. I didn't get to do it this year, unfortunately. But uh, I was preaching a camp for a friend of mine. He was at a church in Florida. And um, 
I was there preaching the high school camp. At the same time, a junior high camp was going on for the same church, and a different guy was preaching for that camp. And so the junior high would meet first, and they would have their worship, and the high school would meet after, and we would have our worship. And so I was sitting one night in the junior high worship service, just preparing for the high school worship that night, and the the guy who was there preaching stood up, and it was kind of the night where he wanted to present the gospel to to help them understand the, the severity of the gospel, what was on the line, and also their need to tell others about the gospel. And I remember thinking it was interesting because as he got up to preach, he had a few bags of fish, like live fish, like goldfish and beta fish that you buy at a, at a pet store. And I was thinking, well, this is going to be interesting. I wonder what he's going to do with the fish. You know, I mean, There's a whole lot of imagery of fish in the Bible. Maybe he's going to use fish imagery and he wants to have an example of a fish. So he begins to, to, to talk about the gospel. And then he begins to talk about the, the consequence if you don't receive the gospel. And the need to tell others of the consequence if they don't receive the gospel. And as he's talking about that, he, he starts grabbing the fish out of the water. And he throws them on the ground. And they just start flopping, like as fish do. And you know, you can imagine the response of the junior high students there. They're screaming and crying. And if you know me at all, I'm pretty passionate about animals. I eat them, but I'm also for them, right? <laughs> and uh, I don't like cruelty to animals. And so I look at my, my, my friend, the youth pastor, and I say, Brother, if you don't stop this right now, I'm about to walk up there and do it myself. So I all, so all you know, all the fish were saved. They were released into a lake there on the property. I know that's probably not the best thing environmentally, but we had limited options. So just know they're safe. Or maybe they were eaten by other fish, and that's just the life cycle. But it wasn't because of that cruelty that they died, all right? But I talked to my friend after, and I said, listen, I, I appreciate what you were trying to do in that moment, to, to communicate the severity of sin and the the upcoming judgment of God. But what concerns me is that you felt the gospel needed that. That you felt that it needed some sort of drastic show, some sort of attention capturer, because the message and the power of the Holy Spirit was not enough. And I wonder how many times in churches... I wonder how many times in our normal life that we think that, hey, you know, this gospel message, it it needs something. It needs some flavor. It needs a kick. No, friends. This message is enough. It is simple on purpose so that we can share it with whoever needs to know about the gospel. And then we trust not in the the emotions of man, not in the plans of man, but the power of the Holy Spirit to make it effective. And that's what we see on display here. Nothing powerful about this man. Nothing showy about this man. Nothing showy about the the place that he's declaring it or even the words that he's using. He just says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the people come. That's what we see. This man has a message, and it draws a crowd. According to verse 5, they are coming from all over Jerusalem and Judea into the wilderness. And there are two major categories of people that we see in the text that come to hear John preach. On the one hand, verse 6, there are some common folk who respond to John in the right way, right? They, They hear the message, and they say, you know what? I need to get prepared. I, I want to repent. I'm going to confess my sin, and I want to get baptized. I want to get ready to receive this king. But then there were some, the religious elite of the day, you see in verse 7, who could not yet see their need for repentance. So some received the message, and some resisted the message. And it just leads me to ask the question, why would someone resist This glorious good news. Why why would anybody hearing, hey, God has been preparing for a great salvation. And he he has sent his son to come and save you. Are you ready? 
Are you ready to receive what God has promised? Are you ready to receive what God has sent from heaven for your good? Why would anyone resist that? Listen, we know we're broken. We know that we need help to get to God. So why would anyone resist that? Well, it all comes down to sin. The reason that we're separated, the reason we need repentance, is oftentimes the reason that we fail to repent. Trusting in the wrong thing, worshiping the wrong thing, it gets you into trouble. The thing that you need to repent from is often the thing that prevents you from repenting because you love it too much. And you, you trust more in it than you trust God. So what about these particular groups? What, what was it that they were trusting in that they needed to be repenting of that prevented them from receiving this message. Let's, let's look at these religious elite groups who resisted the message, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it's important for us to know who they are because we're going to encounter them a lot through the gospel of Matthew. We see them introduced to us in verse 7. And why does John the Baptist respond to them so harshly, calling them a brood of vipers? So who are the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees were a religious party, a lay fellowship, kind of unprofessional fellowship of, of devoted people who delighted, according to one commentary I read this week, in the idea that they were separate. That, that their devotion to the law and their commitment to following the law was greater than anyone else around them. They studied the law, they practiced it, and any time there was any confusion or lack of clarity, they would write additional rules to make sure that they were following as to the best of their ability every piece of the law of God. And it was difficult. And so if, if you stayed with it, even amongst the common people, you were seen as spiritually elite. And they began to think of themselves as spiritually elite as well. They began to think, I must be more righteous than the people around me. Look how good I am. What a dangerous thing to think, right? I mean, if, if we're comparing ourselves to other people, yeah, we may be, we may be really doing really well. But if, if our measuring stick is Christ, I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much you followed. You will always fall short. They thought, why do I need to repent when I am following the law better than anyone else? They were relying on their own morality and they weren't righteous, they were self-righteous. There's a difference. The Sadducees were members of the high priestly party. They were a majority group on the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish religious ruling body. They saw themselves as directly descending from Zadok, the great priest. And they largely rejected the oral tradition of the Pharisees, all the things they were adding to the law to help them obey it more perfectly. They tended to be aristocratic, they were wealthy landowners, and they were suspicious of movements that began among the common people. They were connected to Rome, and they sought to please Rome to protect their own prosperity and their own power. So they had a bloodline, family, they had power, and they had money, all of which they trusted to make them right before God. Surely if I come from this line, I must be in good standing with God. Surely if I have this much blessing in this life, I must be in right standing with God. So on the one hand, we have people who have confidence and their own ability to obey the law. On the other, we have people who have confidence in earthly power and tradition. What a dangerous thing that we see on display in the hearts of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I want you to hear me this morning, friends. Your family history, your own self-righteousness, any earthly power you have, any earthly wealth you have are terrible gods and they are worse saviors. They are fickle and they will not stand in the time of God's judgment. I want you to think about this. When you stand before a holy and righteous God one day, and he says, why should you enter into my kingdom, my, 
eternal kingdom? Why should you be able to fellowship with me and enjoy my presence forever in a new heaven and a new earth? What will you rely on to gain access to the kingdom? If you say, my own works, look how good I am, you will never be good enough to justify that entrance. If you say, well, well, God, my family grew up in the church. I've been a, a Christian my whole life. No, you haven't. I promise you, i got two kids whom I love dearly, and they need Jesus. Nobody's been a Christian their whole life. Who your family is doesn't get you in to the kingdom. Well, I've got all this money. I've got all this power. Unimpressive. To the God of the universe. The only way, the only way we get into the kingdom is through the king. Repenting and believing in him unto salvation. These people trusted more in their lineage than God, more in their own abilities than God, more in their earthly kingdom than God's kingdom. And as a result, John says to them, you are more sons of Satan than you are sons of God. What a terrible thing to say. And so true. When you rely on your own self for salvation, when you think you're greater than God, you are more a son of Satan than a son of God. And that's exactly what John the Baptist tells these people. And he ends with a warning. Ends with a warning. For those who are listening, specifically those who refuse to repent, God is separating out his true people. All of you here who are listening to me, you're all Jewish. You all think you're part of the people of God. But I want you to hear me this morning. All, not all Israel is Israel. Not all, not, yeah, that's it. Not all Israel is Israel. Not all the people of God are actually the people of God. You can have some natural affiliation to something, but it doesn't mean that you're truly a part of the people of God. Only those who are baptized in the baptism of Jesus the ones who receive the Holy Spirit of God, only they will be saved. It's interesting. Even the repentance that's happening here is only effective because a greater one than John the Baptist comes along who makes it effective. He even says, the one who's coming after me is not just baptizing you with water. No, his cleaning is greater. He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and with fire to get rid of all those things that do not honor God. He transforms you in a way that I can't. I'm just helping you get prepared for the greater work that he will do. And only those who take advantage of the work of Christ will be safe. The rest will receive God's judgment. Listen, friends. Even now, verse 10, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 12, he has a winnowing fork in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. It's a message for the church. I hope you know. I mean, just because you're a part of this church does not mean that you are a follower of Christ. If there's no fruit in your life, no evidence of the Spirit of God on your life, there's a reason for concern. I don't want to over-dramatize the concern in the sense I don't want you to question your salvation unnecessarily, but if there is no fruit in your life, I do want you to be concerned and seek the Lord and seek godly counsel. And make sure you're not relying on the wrong things because judgment is coming. And you may need to repent unto salvation to be prepared for the coming of Christ. You know, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to judge the message of John the Baptist, but they are the ones who truly sit under judgment. And John wants them to know, nothing you trust in is greater than Christ. Anytime we trust in the kingdom of this world for our security, we are not ready for the kingdom of heaven We must find all the places in our lives that we have not surrendered to the Lord, to King Jesus, and repent. Initially unto salvation, and then progressively unto sanctification. Making sure that we are as ready as we can be. 
through the work of the Holy Spirit upon our lives to receive the King who is coming. Only the repentant, the humble, who truly see their need for Christ will be ready to receive him. So let me ask you this question, friends. Are you prepared? Because just as our king came here, he will come again. And just as the people of God needed to be ready then, we need to be ready now. And there will be a separation that takes place and that final day of judgment. And the true people of God will be revealed. Those who repented, confessed their sin, and came under the work of Christ. Are you there? When he comes, will you be ready? Or are you trusting in something else? Tradition, your family, wealth, power, status, your obedience, in and of yourself, they cannot save you. Only Christ. Only Christ. And for those of you who are already in Christ, is there greater preparation that needs to happen? Again, not to salvation, but to greater Christ-likeness. Don't you want to be as the bride of Christ, as white and radiant as possible when he returns as our bridegroom? Prepare the way. Be prepared by having those things removed. Repent, confess your sin, and turn to him for salvation and forgiveness. There's a second question here too, though. Not only are we prepared, but are we helping others be prepared? In some ways, as the church, we are inheriting the ministry of John the Baptist. Aren't we supposed to be voices in the wilderness of this world, making straight the path of Christ and the lives of others by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and praying that the Holy Spirit will come and then veil the glory of Jesus to those who are around us? Isn't this the commission that God has given to us, the people of God? Let me just remind you of something this morning. There are 4.6 billion people on this planet who are unreached, who do not know Jesus. 4.6 billion people. 275 million of those don't even have access to the gospel. As far as we know, there's no active voice declaring the good news of Jesus Christ amongst those people. How will they know? Unless we go. In Irving, within a five-mile radius of our church, there are 227, 413,000 people. And that is projected to increase by 6% over the next five years. Do you think all 227, 413 people know Jesus? Or are actively walking with Christ? No, friends, we have work to do. And you may think, but Jared, I don't know what to say. I'm no systematic theologian. I haven't memorized the Bible. Would you see the simplicity of the message this morning? All God's asking you to do is to draw people's attention to Jesus. What if we just committed as the people of God at First Baptist Church of Irving just to tell people about Jesus? So many people walk through their day here and around the world. They don't think about Christ once. What if the name of Christ was so on our lips that people who are not thinking about him would consider him? And occasionally we'd have the opportunity to say, hey, I want you to know what, what God's doing in my life, what he's done in my life through Jesus, and I want you to know it because I want it for you. I want you to turn from these things that don't honor the Lord that will lead to destruction, and I want you to turn to him. There's a better life. Oh, would you know Christ? And would you know what he's done for you? The salvation he's provided. Because listen, friends, judgment is coming. There will be a day when we will have to give an answer to King Jesus. And I know you share my heart that we want as many people as possible to know what to say when they stand before a holy and righteous God because they have an advocate on their behalf whose name is Jesus. That's what we want to give our lives to here at this body. Helping you be prepared to receive Christ. 
at helping others be prepared by the declaration of the gospel. Let's follow in the footsteps of John the Baptist today. Amen? Wherever you are, would you bow your head? Spend some time before the Lord asking him to help you know how to respond to the declaration of God's word this morning. Are you prepared? Have you given your life to Christ? Have you ever confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead? And been saved, knowing for sure where you stand before a holy and righteous God. Let today be the day when you allow the Holy Spirit of God to bring you into the family of God. For those of you who are already in Christ, you need more preparation, not for salvation, but for sanctification. To walk in greater holiness. To prepare yourself for your coming bridegroom as a part of his bride. Would you just think about your life, anything that is in it that doesn't honor the Lord? And would you commit to be more prepared for the coming of Christ by confessing that sin, allowing the conviction of the Holy Spirit to come upon your life, being broken over the distance it's caused between you and God, being broken over the requirement that it required of Christ upon the cross? Would you rejoice in that provision and then commit to walking in obedience to the power of the Holy Spirit that's within you? And then, who are you helping to be prepared? Are you allowing God to use your voice and the wilderness of this world to point people to Jesus? Doesn't have to be that hard, friends. Just let the overflow of the joy you found in Christ be on your lips. Point people to Jesus and see what God does. Oh, Father, would you find us faithful in that? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and respond however you need to respond, certainly in worship to a good God.